In the winter of 1979, the KGB got interested in the old Gulag Butukchek and its surrounding mines, as they promised to hold gold, silver, and perhaps even uranium. The camp had been deserted since 1955 and had not been manned again. You might have heard of it. What should not be known to you, however, is Solovsk, the small town located near the Gulag. Our geologists who have been tasked with exploring the mines were spending their nights in Solovsk, as it was so close by. The Petrovs had worked for us before and sampled some of the loneliest locations of the motherland. They were both exceptional in their field of work and have been the first choice when we decided to explore the area and search for new, precious resources. They soon ventured to the old abandoned mines to take samples. When they did not report back for some time and we got news from the local doctor of something traumatic having happened to them, I was tasked to travel to Solovsk as well, to take care of things. I had not been happy at first, as I did not crave visiting that place at the edge of the earth, but soon I set out. The town and its surroundings were the most unnerving piece of dirt I had ever seen. The memories of the bleakness and desolation of that place still makes me shiver nowadays. A rundown room in the local inn had been rented for me, and I quickly tried to settle in. Even on the first day of my investigation, I sensed that my time in Solovsk would not be blessed, and I wished that another had been hired in my stead. But they had chosen me, as I was known for my thorough and discreet morale. I hurried to question Mr. and Miss Petrov to be able to leave that dump as quickly as possible. As Miss Petrov was the only one still sane enough for a longer talk, I chose to deal with her first. We met in a small side room at the doctor's office that had taken them in, and where they would stay until we could arrange for a specialist to take them. The room was meager, and I would have liked to say that it had seen better times, though that would have probably been a lie. It smelled stuffy and a bit rancid, as if decay had settled in over the years. Miss Petrov was sitting at a boring wooden table, her dark hair disheveled and her eyes underlined with wrinkles. She immediately started talking after I had finished my introduction. You know why they sent us down into those tunnels, don't you? Of course you do. Yes. Well, we have often worked for the government. Some of the most important mining locals have been established because of us. Please keep that in mind before you judge us. We came here some days ago and immediately started exploring after renting a room. The tunnels in these hills are not old, as they have been driven into the ground by the workers not more than twenty years ago. Camp, they called it, but the air told of many lives lost around that place. The rundown barracks, the strange feeling one gets. I felt death residing there. Demise. You might think it to be laughable, but should you decide to venture there, be careful. I'm always careful. Keep talking. I'm sorry. I just want you to understand how we already felt. How it was possible for my husbands to lose it. The tunnels we explored during the first days were quite wide, and the walls were strengthened with wooden bars that had already started to rot. Do you know the smell of musty wood? Disgusting. We did not find much, some traces of uranium. I wanted to give up, but my husband would not hear me. He wanted to try one more tunnel. Just one more. Why did I agree? Why did I not stop him? She stopped and started to look around the room in confusion. Focus. Yes, I'm sorry. That one shaft, that lonely, offside tunnel, was our designated target. It felt different from the others, in a way more barren, bleak, and lifeless. That is why my husband thought it to be the most promising one. He had had a good sense for places bearing resources before. So, we took our tools and went inside. 
I am still shaking when thinking back to that hole and to the freezing winds at that squared entrance into darkness. The air smelled used up and was bitingly cold, making my lungs hurt with every breath. The hillside that the tunnel was driven into was stony and barren, almost as if nature had barely dared to touch it. The tiny vegetation on it was dead and rotten. Normally a good sign. Radiation causes similar effects, and the old tribes of these lands did talk on these hills as a place of death of people and animals getting sick when stepping too close. However... However... what? However, I am not so sure anymore of radiation being the cause of all those tales. You probably think me as just a lunatic, but if you had stood in that tunnel yourself... We went on to explore the old mine shaft. It was not wide enough for both of us, so my husband went in first. The flashlights did not pierce the darkness more than thirty feet in front of us. The walls were hard and limey, trenched and dry. And I am somewhat afraid of closed spaces, not the best conditions to have in my profession. One more reason to be glad for not having to go at the front. Our instruments did not show any noteworthy radiation against our hopes. Our spirits were down, and the air started to get thinner. I could not see that much ahead. He was in front of me, after all, blocking most of the sight. And suddenly, he stopped and listened. He claims to have heard something, decided that it just had been the wind wheezing. I hadn't heard a sound, but I felt a bit sick. Perhaps radiation, after all. Not ten feet later, my husband stopped once more, asked me to be silent. We listened into the darkness. I almost expected to hear a giggle, a howl, or some other terrible sound. Perhaps an animal having gotten lost, but there was nothing. He must have been mistaken. Still, no remarkable readings on the Geiger counter, even a bit less than outside. Perhaps the rocks shielding us from the background radiation. Slowly, we ventured on, breathing heavily. The air got thinner and thinner. I was freezing, but not only from the outside, but also from deep within. From inside my soul. That is the best description I can give you. Your soul was freezing. What is that supposed to mean? I don't know. But that is how it was, down there. My husband must have felt something similar, because when I tapped him on the shoulder to show him the readings, he jumped. It was as if he had almost forgotten that I was behind him. Then he let out a hollow laugh and moved on. I followed him. The darkness in front of us was truly unpleasant. Behind us, the same. Suddenly. Suddenly. What? He screamed. He screamed what? To... to run. And that it was over there. And what was over there? I didn't see anything. I'm sorry. He panicked and shoved me towards the exit. So I ran, trying not to lose my mind. Do you know what that is like? Him just snapping... Just like that. We got to the entrance. You know the rest. Okay. Do you remember anything else? There was a bang. I think the tunnel collapsed behind us. Of course. Thank you. The information I had gotten out of her was not worth a lot. Probably they had just encountered some stray animal or their own fear. The woman had sounded a bit unstable anyway. It would perhaps prove more useful to speak with her husband after all. Talking to Mr. Petrov made me feel more uneasy, but I reminded myself to stay professional and to think about everything from a rational perspective. We met in a treatment room, and it was a lot harder to have a conversation. Mr. Petrov seemed to have gone slightly insane and did not seem to be able to give any sensible answers to my questions. 
Again and again, he started to ignore me and talk to himself. Mr. Petrov, do you know why I am talking to you? I started. I know why you're here. Because of the deep. The deep? The deep. Inside the hills. Inside the ground. I'm here because we were waiting for you and you did not report back to us. Then we got a call from the doctor. A report? Because of the uranium. Uh, I remember. We were supposed to find, to search, and to find, and to bring it to you. The glowing miracle. If you want to phrase it that way, yes. Uh, your wife has already. Where is she? Is she safe? Is she safe from the deep? I don't suppose she is. Nothing is safe from the deep. Not me. Not her. Not you. What is the deep? The deep is below. Below the ground. But it... It is not safe to stay there. Slowly, it will surface to get us all. I have seen it down in the tunnel. That is what I want to talk to you about. Focus and tell me what happened. Back then, he seemed to go completely off the rails and looked at me with a piercing gaze, never closing his eyes. That is what you want to know. Are you absolutely sure? There is no going back once I have told you. You will only get that knowledge out of your head by a bullet. Trust me, that is something I have uh, dealt with before. So keep talking. We were just exploring, at least in the beginning. A hole in a hill, wanting to be explored. So we did that, went inside. Me first, my wife second. I should have known, I should have felt it. She warned me, told me she was sick. But we carried on. No radiation to be felt, no sounds to be heard. Or was I mistaken? I swear there was something in the air, only barely audible. My wife did not hear it. So clueless. Maybe she did not want to hear it. Who knows? We carried on, deeper into the tunnel, into the darkness. What might we discover? Glowing rocks. We went on and on until I heard it again. A whispering breeze, almost like a child. But I did not see anything. It was too dark. Only darkness in front of me. The eternal blackness. We carried on again. The journey. The search. And then... I saw it. He fell silent. His face suddenly showed pain and fear, as if the memories were knives piercing his stomach. Carefully, I asked. The deep. He continued to look at me. His eyes seemed to be begging me to end his life. The deep in front of me, not twenty feet away. The deep sat there in that tunnel. At first, I did not comprehend what I was seeing, what was happening in front of my eyes. It was darkness, but the flashlight should have pierced it. The light was eaten, eaten by the deep. I thought something was inside of it, inside the blackness, but I must have been mistaken. There was nothing. I felt like gazing into an infinite abyss, and yes... The deep is infinite, you see. The deep is infinite. Infinite? And then you ran from it? Of course I ran. Pushed my wife towards the exit, because, you see, the deep was slowly chasing in on us. It got closer and closer, ate the tunnel and the light. I think it might be here already, here with us. You have to warn them, uh, perhaps... Perhaps we might still escape from it. Somehow, the deep is already here. Then, he just seems to give up, and started to giggle like a madman. 
I left him and his wife in the care of the local doctor. We had to search the camp and its surroundings, as I reluctantly realized. When I took some men to the mines, I found exactly what the Petrovs had told me. A caved-in tunnel. There were some other shafts close by, but nothing noteworthy was inside. Not far away, near a pile of rubble, we found a tramp that must have slept close by. He was brought to the station of the local militia, where I interrogated him. The man was dirty and reeked of urine, though he was quite happy to talk to me. Where do you want me to start? Well, you told us that you sometimes sleep near the mines. That's correct. Normally, I don't have a roof above my head, you see. And that's why I go to the mines. There are many tunnels leading down into the ground, and the trenches nearby are roofed as well. The ones that the workers pushed the carts through long ago. It was easier that way, you know. That said, I would have liked it if those criminals had had it a bit harder. I heard of that, yes. Were you staying there during the night to escape from the rain? Exactly. Because of the rain. And those cursed birds. The mines are the only place where I can get some quietness. I hate those doves and owls. They did not let me sleep all week. Stupid things. Do you know how annoying cooing can be? I bet you do. Yes, it's happened to me as well, once or twice, when I was camping. But back to the mines. You said that you were there when those two people came running out. Please, uh, tell me about that evening. Try to remember every detail. Of course. Of course. I already told you that I was just looking for a quiet place. I knew about the gulag, of course, uh, that had been there until shortly before I arrived here, and I heard that they were digging up some uranium. The latter part is only a saying, you see. I do not believe that. Uranium, in these parts, never. Uh, nowadays, they claim to find it everywhere. The area around the mines is not that bad. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, there are stories of death and a curse, but what do I know? Sounds made up and uh, superstitious. If you ask me, life itself is a curse. At least when you're a poor sod without a place to stay. But at least I'm not a Kulak. Didn't you tell me that you refused to go to a shelter? No one's forcing you to sleep out in the open. Or am I mistaken? They suck. Who knows what they do to you in those so-called shelters. If only she hadn't left me. Everything would still be fine. It's her fault. I see. Let's say it can get pretty bad. But now, tell me. That evening... All right. Uh, sorry. So, I was looking for a dry place and went to the gulag. You were there. Uh, you know, there are plenty of suitable spots. So, uh, I looked around. Uh, the sides of the hills were covered by snow and uh, the bare trees would have not protected me from the weather. I did not want to get sick, after all. Uh, some houses are nearby. If you can even call them that, uh, where the workers had slept. I thought about resting there, but... I didn't like the place. It seemed uninviting, slightly evil. But perhaps that's just because I remembered some of the stories. Stories? What kind of stories? Just some crap. Crap that's told about places like that, where people have died. The work here has not been pleasant. Yeah, let's put it that way. Insanity spreads among the people. Perhaps because their minds start to rot away, or perhaps there was uranium after all, frying their brains. But I think that's not likely. If you're forced to work like that, day after day, year after year, until the end of your life, yeah, you just snap. Well, they got what they deserved, right? At least uh, I'm free and not a traitor to the motherland. Some people say they did experiments on the inmates, probed their brains after sawing off their skullcaps, 
without anesthesia. Imagine that. I wonder if at least they learned something new. Well, whatever. People are said to have died every day. That changes a place. Let me tell you that. Yeah, those are the stories. Some killed themselves. Some just died laughing maniacally. Hanging was apparently quite the trend. And all that grisly stuff. I had the skull field that the old nomads had created many years ago, before the gulag had opened its gates. They said that that place is the seat of death itself. Take all that together, and I think you understand why I did not want to sleep there. Better not. And the smell, as if everything was soaked in piss. Disgusting. So, I looked for another place. The entrances to the mine seemed much more inviting. Well, as far as you can call such a gaping hole in a snowy hill inviting at all. But it would protect me during the night. So there I lay down in the entrance of one of those tunnels. And there you stayed, until those two geologists. Yeah, that was the fourth night of me sleeping there. And not much happened the night before. Nothing much happened in the nights before. Nothing much or nothing? Uh, well, in the third night, I was a bit drunk, but uh, only a bit. How much? A bottle of vodka. Yeah, I know. Don't look at me like that. I can't do nothing about that. Makes me feel warmer than a campfire ever could. I didn't have any matches left anyway. Spent all my money on... I get it. I do not want to judge you. I only want to find out what happened. So, what did happen? The thing that was uh, nothing much. Don't know why, but I did not want to go deeper into the tunnel. There was this bad inkling, sickness. But it was not fear, I think. Uh, probably the vodka. Yes, uh, I'm not afraid of a stupid mine. Of course not. Yeah, but nonetheless, I think there was something with me. Perhaps some animal deep inside the shaft. Who knows, wolves can sometimes get pretty lost. Whatever, I stayed at the entrance and didn't go any further. Not deeper into the dark. Why would I? The night was clear, full moon shone brightly. Quite pretty, you know. It can be very pretty over there, even when it's day. The sun and the bushes cast funny shadows. I slept at the entrance, protected from the snow, safe. What else could I wish for? It was all right for some days. After that, I planned on getting some food. One of the bakers sometimes lets me have some bread. Did you see something? Was there more than a suspicion? No, that was it. The next evening, I suddenly heard screams. When I got up, I barely could see two people running away. They looked as if the devil himself was pursuing them. Then, roaring, and part of the hill crashed down. Bam! I was shocked. At first, I thought of going into those barracks nearby. I did not want to get crushed, but... I deemed it better to be careful because of the, the, the thought of spirits of the dead workers. So, uh, since then, I stayed below a big tree. The weather changed for the better, uh, after all. I see. So, you're telling me that two people ran away. Did they feel sane to you? Can you tell me anything about that? No. Uh, well... Yes. The guy was screaming something like, in the blackness, in the blackness, uh, the deep. There's something along those lines, I think. And the woman seemed just confused. As confused as one is with having just escaped a rock slide. Uh, don't really know. Thank you. You've been a great help. You may leave. Of course, he had not really helped me at all. But what was I supposed to say to that poor tramp? 
I let him go, and he went back to the mines to look for a new place to sleep. Perhaps everything would be easier than I thought. A man having gotten exposed to too much radiation, an unfortunate rock slide, nothing more. Back then, I was confident, was sure that I could soon deal with important things again. I thought of the events as insignificant. I would be proven wrong. A young girl, perhaps nine years old, was standing at my doorstep the next morning, a little self-made doll in her hands. She nervously introduced herself as Etrushka. I asked her into my room, hesitantly, as I was not good with children and did not have time anyway. But maybe she had heard something. She lived at the edge of town, after all. All right, you want to talk to me? Yes. Are you looking at secret things? That's what my mom said. Everybody talks about you. I've seen something secret. And something scary. I see. Uh, your mother... Okay. Uh, what did you see? What's secret and scary? I was playing a bit away from the houses. I always play there. And it was there when I observed something. You need good observations, don't you? Yes, indeed. Uh, please, tell me. What did you observe? Do you know the trees? A bit away from the houses. Those old, gnarly trees that grow everywhere. That grow and bloom in the summer. I've seen them. I have a hiding place nearby. Uh, but that's a special place. So please don't tell anyone about it. Promise. It's my job to keep things secret, so, yes, I promise. Please, tell me more. Usually, I'm climbing those trees with Andresh, but he has the flu. This is why I was alone. I played with my doll and sat inside my hiding place. Then I decided to go climbing. And that's why I went to that tree. My favorite tree. Suddenly, she got calmer. Her once firm manner of speaking faded, and her voice began to crack. I did not know what to do, so I offered her some cookies. That seems to help a bit. Very kind. That tree, my tree, it has a hole. Not just a small knot hole, but a big one, as big as my hands. A bird lived there last summer. Do you know something like that? Yes, I do. Perhaps a strong woodpecker made it. They sometimes do stuff like that. That's right. That might be. Or uh, perhaps it was just an old tree. I didn't really take note of it. At first, I probably only looked for it because I remembered the cute little bird from last summer. Uh, did it fly south? But then I spotted it. Or, in a way, did not. She fell silent. I started to get nervous. Perhaps I should call her mother. This was her job. But then, I stopped. In a way, did not. What do you mean? It, it was just black. Very dark. Terribly dark and mean. I was very afraid. I'm still afraid. But don't tell my mom, because she might not let me play by the tree anymore. And that's where my secret place is, you see. Don't worry. I won't tell her. The hole was black. In what way? Was it evening? No. It was about three. That is what the clock at the church tower showed. I can already tell the time, you see. The sun was shining, but the rays never reached the hole, because that part of the tree never faces the sun. It's always covered in shadow, that hole, but not yesterday. Yesterday it was just black, as if light could not go there. Can't light go everywhere? I couldn't even see the remains of the bird's nests from summer. I also couldn't see the inside of the tree. Nothing. 
Just darkness. Just blackness. I was so terribly afraid. It was weird, and it had no smell. Then I took all my courage and got a bit closer. I swear something was inside the darkness. I think. But nothing alive. No animal. No plant. But something. Something that could think. I felt like being washed away by it, as if I could barely hear anything around me, because the darkness bewitched me, as if the hole got bigger and bigger and bigger. It grew. No, that's just what it felt like. I took a pebble and threw it inside from far away. It took some time until I hit the hole. I'm not good at throwing, but then I made it. Do you know what happens then? No. Nothing. And that made me even more afraid. No sound. And the pebble did not bounce back. Scary. Was the tree bewitched? As if it had eaten the pebble? I ran home. I took a flashlight to make the dark go away. When I came back, nothing was there anymore. No nest, no pebble just a cavity in the tree. Then I went home, was too afraid of the outside. But today, I immediately ran to you, as fast as I could, because I knew that you were looking for secrets and might be able to help me. She was exhausted, and I called her mother. The woman was quite nervous, as she had a rough idea about my profession, but I hurriedly told her that Etruska had done nothing wrong. After they had left, I went to their neighborhood and finally spotted the tree. At least one thing had not been a lie. A strange, smooth hollow sat inside its trunk. For the rest of the day, I started to plan the clearing of the caved-in tunnel, which I had set for the next morning in light of the events. It had already gotten very late in the night, when suddenly a call from the militia reached me. I got somewhat uncomfortable, as they told me another half-mad person had come to the station. With worries, I set out and arrived not ten minutes later. A young woman was sitting in one of the interrogation rooms, visibly shocked and sweating. Under normal circumstances, I would have described her as attractive and pretty, but the crazy look in her eyes did not sit well with me at all. Can, can you help me? You have to help me. Please. How? Hey, it. I don't know if it's still there. The train station. Take a deep breath. What's that about the train station? I, I was coming back to town. Had been visiting my sister for the last week. During the way back home, there was this feeling. A premonition. That something terrible was about to happen. And when I finally left the train, I immediately spotted him. Or did I smell him? This stench. The train left, and the platforms were drenched in darkness. Most of the lights broken. He was sitting there, leaning against that old lump of concrete they called Concourse. I knew he was planning something. That dirty tramp. Did he harass you? No. Not at first. He just sat there with his filthy sweater and that felted hood. Wasn't he freezing at all? Uh, perhaps he was already dead, killed by the cold, or so I thought. I mean, it's not very warm around this time. But he was still alive. Yes. I was just standing there, waiting for my taxi. The train station is some distance away from town, so you would not expect me to walk with all my luggage, wouldn't you? No, of course not. Exactly. I was keeping an eye on him, that dirty lot. He was just sitting, leaning against the wall, his head deep in the hood. I could only see his chin from where I was standing. Then he started shaking, perhaps a bad dream, but nothing else happened. Despite that, I was afraid. Afraid that he would get up and drag me into some bushes. It is known that young women are sometimes... I understand your reservations. 
Indeed. I was so afraid. Uh, what if he jumped at me? The last rays of light that the old lamps on the ceiling gave off made me feel somewhat comfortable, though. Despite that, I started feeling chilly. And not because of the temperatures, but because of something growing deep inside of me. Something that made me feel... True fear. It was bottomless. True fear. I must have scanned my surroundings, as my instincts told me that I might not be alone with this tramp. But there was only the blackness of the night, uh, then. At this point, she stopped telling her story, and just looked at the table she was sitting at. He started coughing, then almost a roar screamed in terror. The shock almost made me lose my senses, and I nearly fainted. I was afraid of him getting up, running at me, determined. Again, she stopped, took a moment to collect herself. But he just sat there, not moving anymore. Only the hood, this darkness. I could not see the features of a man anymore. No skin, just darkness, a deep darkness, as if the shadows had swallowed his face, just like that. And then he rose, had turned around towards me, just stood there. Oh, Lord, this darkness, like an eternal abyss filled with abominable demons, hypnotizing and evil, somehow thing started moving, made one step, even though I'm not sure that it did not have a head anymore, no human one, at least. Who knows what wraith was resting under that hood, what terrors hid in its depths. Another step towards me. I couldn't stop looking. Another step. I had to escape, escape that being. She started hyperventilating. I had a dark suspicion, but did not tell her. I asked her to calm down and keep on telling her story. I couldn't get away. He was blocking me. It was blocking me. I came closer. I was almost there. Thinking back to those moments, I finally turned around, ran, and ran away in the other direction. The road runs around the hill, so I managed to get home after all, but you know what? What? In the darkness, I was not alone anymore. Not alone anymore. Not alone anymore. She seemed to start dozing off right in front of me. I did not stop her and took some officers of the militia and went to the train station. Our flashlights parted the night and we were ready to search the surrounding area, but that provided to be unnecessary. Next to the tracks, below dead ceiling lamps, we found the ragged clothes of a man. Their owner, however, was gone. I knew the hooded sweater. I had seen it not long ago. It belonged to Alexia Yu, the poor soul that we had found near the mines and that I had interrogated before. I don't know what I found more disturbing. The fact that something might have infected him when he had returned to the mines in search for a place to sleep, against all reason or the fact that we discovered the belt still being buckled. How could he have possibly undressed? We never saw the tramp himself ever again, and the most insane theories of his whereabouts are still keeping me awake at night, even to this day. At this point in time, it started to become apparent that we were not dealing with tall tales, but possibly with some kind of bioweapon. What else could cause such hallucinations? I was so sure that American agencies had smuggled them in and that they had used them to hurt our great country. I immediately called my supervisors. To my dismay, they decided to observe the situation for a bit longer. Had I been the one to make a decision, I would have ended all of this with a clean area bombing. We deemed it unwise to inform the residents of Solovsk about the situation, as we knew that, otherwise, we would not be able to keep the people in town. We had to contain this virus 
at all costs. During the next few days, I began interrogating as many locals as I could, starting at the edges of Solovsk that were closest to the mines, the same area where little Itrushka lived as well. The statements painted a rather unsettling picture, but at least they all seemed to verify that somewhere around that part of town there were hallucinogens poisoning the air. I have added the ones that are probably the most relevant in retrospect. Testimony of Dimitri Y. 28, 12, 1973. Whether I saw something, I sure as hell did. Those children were trespassing again. Can you believe that? Irresponsible parents. You know how often they nowadays let their children fetch water from their well? Every day, at least ten buckets. Even more when frost is imminent. You know how much energy it wastes when they heat up that water for their baths? Irresponsible. They had once been normal people. I've known them for long. Probably forgot harder times. Was there anything else? No. I have to get back to work. And there they are, trespassing again. Go away. Ask them. Testimony of Guskov W. and Apolkov S. 29 12, 1973. We don't want to play over at our place anymore. Our parents are so strange. Strange? What do you mean? Strange. They can't tell you more. Same for me. They just feel different. Foreign. Even though nothing has changed. I have to admit, I'm a bit afraid of him now. Me too. Me too. So we go to Dimitri. He shouts at us a lot, but at least he's normal. Anything else? No. Testimony of Sadova A. 29 12 1973. Are you the electrician? No, I'm not. I am a party member. We are currently investigating. You will understand that I require your full cooperation. I didn't know. I'm so sorry. The electrician's visit has been due for two days. That's why I just assumed that the streetlights aren't working anymore. How am I supposed to walk my dog at night without breaking my bones? Since when are they broken? Three days ago, I think. Did something else happen these past few days? No, nothing. Thank you. Testimony of Selko, O. 29, 12, 1973. The government. Yes, I'm investigating. Because of the air. What about it? It smells disgusting all the time. It reeks of vinegar. Sometimes the air is fresh and clean, and suddenly... I see. Where, exactly? Everywhere. Here, at the other end of Solovsk. That's all I can say. After I was done, I went back to the militia to think everything through. Much of the things the locals had told me sounded rather unimportant. That is why I was not in good spirits when I remembered that the old gulag had not been searched yet. Maybe I would get lucky there. Slowly, I set off towards those rotten barracks and tunnels of the old camp, hoping to find at least some clues. As soon as I entered the first house, I got chills, and an unpleasant heaviness started to numb my mind. The building almost looked like a farmhouse, its walls covered in peelings of white paint, its windows white and dull, making it impossible to look inside. After entering... A smell of stale, rotten air greeted me, and I could hear the wind wheezing through cracks in the old walls. The first room I sat in was filled with rusty bunk beds which had resisted the flow of time remarkably well. I knew about the people that had perished at this place years ago, all those that had risen their dirty fists against our motherland, all those traitors and kulaks. This is where they had paid their price, and worked and died. Carrying on, I got to an old prison ward where the worst of the worst had been held and killed. Those who even refused to redeem themselves through a life of hard work. Most of the heavy iron doors were closed. 
but in one I found human remains, together with the savage smell of old rot. Looking at that old corpse made me sick and dizzy, even though I'd seen dead men before. Remembering my objective, I examined the room and carried on towards the next part of the building. I really wish I hadn't. The place I entered etched itself into my mind, a strange, sterile-looking room, leading into several small chambers. Worryingly, I noticed the stench of death getting even worse, the sources undeniably being in some of those rooms. What did I even hope to find here? The solution to my case? Never. I should have left. Hesitantly, I approached the reeking door. The floor in front of it was colored dark, probably dried blood. Slowly, my hand found the handle and opened the door. Instead, there was a treatment room, almost like a dentist's office. But on the seat, I found a horribly mangled corpse, its eyes long rotten away, its open mouth frozen in place by rigor mortis, making it emit an eternal, silent cry of death. The skull plate was missing, sawn off, electrodes still resting in the remains of the brain. What had they done at this place? The KGB's research was known to me, but I had never seen it firsthand. Quickly, I left the room and tried to keep my lunch in my stomach, though I failed miserably. Shaking, I spit it all over the ground. Christ. I would not find anything so it would be wiser to leave this hell. When turning around, a strange sound started to echo through the building. It sounded like choppy cries of a dove, disturbing me more than anything before. That innocent sound of calamity. Then, coughing and wheezing joined in, and finally, whimpering. In shock, I saw one of the doors slowly open, and a man exited one of the rooms. His stomach ripped wide open, so that his decomposed intestines were hanging out, the arms and legs thin and haggard, the face a grimace, missing the eyes. How was it alive? What was happening? What? What am I? The creature fell, twitching on the ground. When it finally stopped, I decided, against all sanity, to take a closer look at it. I was terribly afraid, but had a duty as well. And after all, I still had a gun. Slowly, I walked towards it, tiptoeing forwards. Again and again, I stopped, waiting for the creature to suddenly get up again. It didn't. Finally, I managed to calm down and climbed over the body. A part of me expected it to try and grab me, but... It was dead. After finally entering the room, I was in for another shock. There, on a table, the same body was lying. How? I did not need more questions. I needed answers. A whisper was in the winds that came through the open window into the room, and like in a bad dream, I looked at the corpses on the table and on the ground. That was not possible. I left the building and leaned against a wall, slowly breathing. Then, I called for backup. The militia had come quickly and searched the barracks thoroughly, but aside from the copied body, nothing out of the ordinary was found. They took care of the bodies, the way they always did. After we had finished searching everything, we headed back to town. I went back to my room and tried to relax, which... I even managed to do after some time. My head seemed to quiet down, the empty room protecting me and made me feel strangely safe. In the evening, an old man came by to visit me, having heard of my investigations and looking for a talk. He was a bit absent-minded, but had a friendly glimmer in his eyes. He immediately started talking. I know why you are here. Perhaps... Perhaps it has something to do with it. Please, go on. I rarely leave my home, 
as my bones have become weak due to all the hard work I have done, and my mind has suffered from time as well. This is why I had first thought of everything as a hallucination, that I was imagining things. I really love looking at the night sky, the one thing that can give me peace. Some time ago, I built myself a telescope to witness the beauty of the Milky Way. It is very romantic, and me and my wife love looking up, observing things like the meteorites and lights some months ago, or the comets that passed by last year. The heavens are a truly magnificent place of wonder. Two days ago, I was looking up into the depths of space as well, towards Orion, my favorite constellation. Up there, the power of the stars slumbers, but... What? At first, I thought that there was dirt on the lens. Just a small, dark spot, erasing some of my sight. Then, another thought dawned. The stars were going out. They were going out, one after another, perhaps eaten up by some sinister mass. That was nonsense, of course. Something like that can't happen. The sky was clear when I looked at it with my eyes, so it had to be something on the lens. I decided to look at it the next day, as I was tired. When morning came, and I had finished brewing some coffee, I noticed it because of my mug that cast a dark shape onto the table. It was not the dark itself, not the shadow I could see clear and black, but whatever lay in that darkness, waiting, drooling, seeking for something in me that I couldn't understand at all. It was the darkness looking in my direction. My mind told me that no creature could live inside that spot, as it was not bigger than the palm of my hand. Nevertheless, a cold shiver ran down my spine when I looked at it, like a small trench into nothingness. That is what the shadow looked like. I reached for the mug, my hands shaking. Perhaps I was just imagining things, but it felt strange, cold, but not in my skin, but inside my hand. It was difficult to touch the mug, as if an invisible barrier of fear kept me away, or an instinct. But finally, I managed to push the cup away. It flew off the table and shattered on the floor. The shadow remained, like a hole in the table. I got on my knees, took a look from below. There was nothing out of the ordinary. I got sick. I've seen a lot during the years in the camp, but... That hole was the most disturbing thing I have ever witnessed. It was so deep, eternal and deep, deeper than space, which I had loved to look at, untouchable, infinitely distant. Is it still there? I had gotten anxious, but did my best not to show him. No, when the first rays of sun hit it, it disappeared. I see. Yes. And that is what you saw yesterday. Yes. This spot. This darkness. This deep. Since those moments, it is as if it was everywhere in my house. As if it had entered in all the dark spots there are. Every moment... I did not see the black again, but still, I knew that it still hides in every shadow. I could only sleep with all the lights on. Can you imagine that? Just to escape the dark, sleeping in the light without a blanket, because under a blanket there is darkness. Do you understand? Yes, I do. I don't think so. It is even in this room, in every shadow. Thank you. Would you be so kind as to follow me? I want you to talk to another colleague of mine. Of course. I brought him to the local doctor. If he had gotten in contact with some contaminant, there surely were some tests to prove it. 
but we did not get that far. When sitting in the waiting room of the doctor's office, the old man got more and more agitated, anxious. He was shaking like a child. It is in all the dark. In everything. Don't you understand what that means? If I were to close my eyes, the darkness would be there. So close. Inside of me. Please, help me. He tried to stop blinking. His eyes had started getting teary when I had enough and left the room. I was just telling the receptionist that I was leaving when coughing and howling came from the waiting room. We stormed inside, but all that we found were two terrified patients and the corpse of the old man. He... he was refusing to blink as he told you. What a madman. Then... Then he wasn't able to keep his eyes open. He wasn't able to keep them open anymore. His lids closed. His gaze full of terror. And when he opened them again, his eyeballs were gone. Only a deep darkness remained. An abyss. I think he was dead instantly. He fell, twitched around, and then was gone. The other patient was not able to give a statement and had to be injected with sedatives. The cause of death was quickly found. The old man's head was completely hollowed out. Looking at the corpse made me feel cold and the effects it had had on the sanity of the other patients. Was it spreading through the air? Was I contaminated as well? Or what if there was something real in that lonely town? Something in the dark that possibly seemed crazy. But I had to start considering it. You never know. The situation worsened in the following weeks. Rumors of a mysterious deep that slowly invaded the lives of more and more people began to spread. Mistrust started to grow. The way some people behaved got increasingly stranger. Some acted as if they did not feel at home in their own skin. The edges of town were the first areas to show more signs of the deep. Things disappeared. From cupboards, from garages, from bedrooms, from bags. The darkness was witnessed again and again, and was dreaded and feared. I myself did not see it for a long time, and still looked for explanations. Aided by the local doctor, and an expert for bioweapons I had sent for, but I found none. I felt more and more pressed to order an area bombing, but part of me clung to hope. I think it was the nights of January 15th when I got another call. Taking the current situation into account, I had waited for one on a daily basis. Despite that, I felt uneasy. After listening, I hurried into the night, when I got to the place where it had happened, I was admittedly glad that little Etrushka was still alive and breathing, clinging to her rag doll. But what she told me, crying, made my stomach hurt. They're... they're gone. Gone? Who? My parents. They're gone. It took them. It took them both. It? Did you see something? No, but I felt it deep inside of me. Since yesterday, I wanted to go to you, but they did not let me. They told me I was fantasizing. They? Uh, who? Your parents? No. Well, they looked like my parents, but they were different. I didn't notice it at first. Only when I was with them for a bit longer. When we were eating lunch, they talked like always and were having a small argument. Suddenly, I felt it, as if someone was pouring really cold water on my head. You know. And it happened suddenly. Without warning, they suddenly looked different at Mom and Dad. The same ones, but different. Maybe they moved in a strange way. It talked differently. I can't really remember anymore. But 
They were not my parents. They were strangers in my house. Something must have taken them in the night. A, a monster. I said nothing because I didn't want them to notice. But they must have suspected something and did not allow me to go outside anymore, only to wait in my room. The day passed by so slowly. I wanted to escape, but who would have believed me? Grown-ups would only have said that I was imagining things, that I was playing around. My real mom always said things like that as well, all the time. So I stayed inside my room, with Aunt Livy, my doll. And then the sun started to fade behind the hills. It grew cold. Nobody talked during dinner. We were eating clear, watery soup. My real mom would have made it with veggies. She would have, because dinner is important. Nobody spoke. We only sat there, disgustingly silent. We didn't even look at each other. And suddenly, I knew that they would come and get me as well, in the night. That they would call the monsters. I didn't know what to do. I decided to stay awake as long as possible. I did not feel safe in the dark because... Because of the stories. Because of the hole in the tree. Yes. I only had a little flashlight. The light protected me and Aunt Livy. Then the time had come. My fake parents went to bed. I heard them walk down the hallway. They were breathing heavily as if they had walked for an hour. Some light came from the hallway. I could see it through the slits below the door. It wanted to make me feel safe so I would go to sleep. I was terribly afraid. Would it come through the window or through the door? Was it already under my bed or with me? Would it slither out slowly, a pure evil like a snake and take me away? leaving another Idruska behind. Did something come for you? No. No, it was worse. I almost wished that a monster had come, but no. Everything was quiet until... What happens then? Idruska, you don't have to be afraid anymore. I am here now. Everything is fine. I am gonna make it right. So please, help me and tell me what happened. These screams coming from the fake mom and the fake dad. They screamed, almost roared. They were not my parents, and yet I was so shocked and dropped my flashlight, listening into the night. Then I mustered all my courage and left my bed, holding on to Aunt Livy. We had to stay together. The door was creaking. It was creepy, and when I opened it, the hallway seemed to get colder and more humid. But maybe I just imagined that. I looked towards the room of my parents. What did you see? You can tell me. I will believe you, I promise. Nothing. Just darkness. The long hallway was illuminated, the way it always was in the evening, but behind the door frame leading to the room of my fake parents. Only blackness. Like the hole in that tree, but much, much bigger. An abyss so deep, I'm, I'm not sure, but maybe it might be that something was moving inside. Something like the monster that took my parents, looking for prey. Or maybe there was nothing, nothing at all. A hollowness, you know, just a big emptiness. A uh, deep. And then it came towards me. The lights in the hallway went out, and then it was really close. That darkness. I looked out of my room out into the heavy darkness that made breathing more and more difficult. And something approached. I felt it. I was sure. 
I wanted to slam the door shut so it could not reach me, could not come into my room, not into the only room still illuminated by the flashlight on the ground. The door was almost shut, but then something pressed against it from the other side. Something had come through the deep. Or was it the darkness itself? I don't know. I don't know. Did I hear whispering? Or were those just my own thoughts? I just don't know. I'm so confused. Her tears did not stop. You are really helping me. And you are very brave. I tried to calm her. It took some time. Then she regained some composure. What happens next? I looked outside the window. The moon shone a bit, so there was light outside. Moonlight, uh, I, I ran to the window and climbed out. I don't know why, but it was not entirely closed. It's okay. You are very brave. Thank you for telling me. Very good. Please, do not leave me alone out here. I don't want to be alone. Aunt Livy is the only thing I have left. I will take care of it. The little girl was traumatized, but I admired her courage. The screams of her parents had notified Militia and me, and so she did not have to stay too long under that street lamp where we had found her, alone, only that tattered doll in her arms. I did worry about her, however. What if she had gotten contaminated? Or worse? What if she had not? If truly there had been? I did not want to think about it, but I had to know. The house looked huge in the faint light of the moon. The windows seemed giant, and I could not see inside as it was too dark. I did not spot any light, and thus could not determine where Etruska's room was located, until I saw the open window. Had something from the outside. And there it was. The deep. The deep inside the house. Or somewhere else. Inside my head. Hypnotizing, like a curse, like a siren. A darkness suppressing one's soul. A gorge of black energy, making the heart pound. When I think back to the deep, I could not tell whether something was hiding inside, whether something rushed towards me through that darkness. Though, the boundlessness I felt has never left me. I was so glad that the moon protected me and warded it off somehow. And suddenly, I realized new moon was near. The black night that once every month fully robbed the night sky of its gleaming disk. What would happen? Would the deep swallow the town and everything inside? Erase the inhabitants, the houses, the buildings, the streets? I had to think, because if it were true, if the deep would take everything, no bombs were needed. My hands could stay clean. I could just let it happen and did not have to worry anymore. Did someone else suspect it? That new moon would bring the end? I don't think so. Everybody was just too afraid to notice. I made a decision. The next day, I left town. I turned my back on it, the way I should have done long before. After all, not only the deep threatened my other comrades. No, those mysterious, strange people that had been seen more and more often deeply disturbed me as well. After I was gone, the problem would maybe solve itself. I took a car and left. Left that hellhole. That city of the deep. My supervisors knew about it. 
They knew that all they had to do was wait until Solovsk and its residents would fall into darkness. And even if not, the bombers were ready. I did not tell the militia or Solovsk, just ordered them to calm down the others. I promised that help would come, one way or another. When I sat in a safe place on the evening of January 17th, I prepared for the call I had to make. I had to be sure that everything would go down as I suspected. After some deep breaths, I called the station of the militia in Solovsk. How is it over there? Is everything all right? I just heard a panicked voice screaming. Thank God you called. We didn't get through to anybody else. The lights are fading. The darkness is coming. It's coming from everywhere. The hills, the houses, the holes. It's coming. This horrible deep. You know, don't you? You know. Please help us. Are you certain? Of course. We can't escape the lights. They're starting to flicker. The deep. The deep is here. You have to... That is all there was before the line went dead forever. They sent some planes in the following days. We got some pictures. The town was gone. Not a soul to see. Only the mines. The mines where the deep had come from in the first place. I do not know if it had gotten everyone. Perhaps someone managed to escape. Was someone out of town when it happened? Solvosk had been isolated, and the residents had not had much contact with other towns. So it was more or less easy for us to cover everything up. Whether I had a bad conscience because I left them behind? All those people? All those children? No, I do not. I did what had to be done. I had to make sure that no one survived. You might think of me as a monster, but I don't care. Though, independent of all those events, some good things happened as well. About a week later, after a long time of waiting, my brother and his wife managed to adopt a little girl. A little girl and her ragged doll. <laughs>